So um, the presentation is about our experience at eBay building a private cloud. It will be a two-part uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Jesse Martin. I'll present I'm cloud architect at eBay, and I'll present the reason why we built a private cloud and um, what are the components that we extended in OpenStack to uh, make it work. And Subu will talk about why it's not enough, and Subu is leading our engineering. So the, the, the main reason why we, we built a, a private cloud at eBay is um, agility. And uh, you can uh, go back to our analysis conference uh, presentations made by all our executives uh, in 2013. And you can see that every one of them listed accelerating innovation as the primary goal for eBay. And uh, you can also look at our CTO's number. You see that the rate of innovation doubled between 2011 and 2012. So what this means is the number of features that developers were able to push to uh, the site doubled during that period of time. And uh, this means that we had to improve developer agility and how developers can uh, develop code and push it very quickly to the site. So the first high-level goal for us was to enable agility. And uh, the second reason is that we wanted to build an infrastructure that could support all the various parts of eBay. So you, you may think that eBay um, is this uh, weird entity, and it's made of many different um, adjacencies or companies that we acquired over time. And each one of them have either their own environment or they have portion of um, the, our data center dedicated to them. They might have even their own ops team and their uh, own uh, practices to manage their, the site. In addition to that, each one of those companies or entities have their own sub-environment, like one for QA, one for their secure um, applications, one for their production application, and so on. And you can imagine that if you had to build separate infrastructure for each one of those environments and uh, companies, it would get out of control very quickly. So the, the main goal for us was to provide also an infrastructure that could be shared between all those entities and provide the same level of uh, isolation and uh, agility that they used to have with their dedicated environment, plus more efficiency by consolidating everything. So what we did is we built something that really looks like a public cloud, except that it's running inside our data centers. What it means is that it's frictionless. You don't need to have approval tickets or anything to get an account and start deploying VMs and deploy your application. It's isolated, multi-tenant. If you, you are an adjacency or uh, like, for example, PayPal, StubHub, and you want to run your application on our cloud, you need to have the guarantee that you are isolated and uh, you are the, on, in control of your application and you can prove that you are the only one able to control this infrastructure. And we wanted to have the experience um, of a public cloud, which means that you don't see all the seams between different environments, right? So it's a large cloud that can accommodate all the, the infrastructure, all the, the requirements for all those companies, not like many different clouds that would be dedicated to each one of those companies. So really, it looks like a, a public cloud. So what it means, the result of that is that we, from a June, uh, May, May 2013, you can see the, the growth of users, and uh, you can see that at a point, the, the number of projects is increasing because we gave users the possibility to create multiple projects to deploy their application in multiple different environments. You can also see the, the, the start of um, distribution of users between all those different uh, entities that I talked about. So the big one is uh, eBay, the smaller one next to it is PayPal, and then there's all these other uh, entities that are starting using our infrastructure. And you can imagine that uh, it's a lot of flexibility for them to have the shared infrastructure instead of deploying their, their own uh, dedicated infrastructure and managing it. The number of VM created since uh, May 
It's 100,000 VMs created and deleted. And uh, you can see that there's the curve is uh, like a hockey stick. And it's kind of scary because uh, in terms of capacity and pressure on, uh, on the team, it's uh, starting to, uh, to be uh, quite uh, huge. And this is the number of cores. Every week, we are adding machines. And in order to build a real cloud, it means that you cannot tell users, stop provisioning VMs, we are running out of resource. You cannot do that. So we have to make sure that we have a pipeline that is efficient and we can bring machines every week into the cloud to ad adapt to that demand. And I think that we are, what, like 15,000 cores in, in that environment? As of last week. As of last week. So what did we have to do in order to build a multi-tenant cloud on top of uh, OpenStack? So you look at the, the, the blue um, components are entities that already exist in OpenStack. So on top of the infrastructure, we define regions. So that's a concept that already exists in OpenStack. But on top of it, we need to define availability zones. And availability zones for us is similar to what Amazon defines an as an availability zone. It's something that allows people to define a, a isolated environment where they know that faults will not impact the other uh, environment. Uh, VPC is really uh, the same concept that what Amazon calls a VPC. It's a dedicated cloud for one of those entities. So it's a coarse-grain multi-tenancy concept that allows, for example, uh, like our GSI or other entity to um, have their, their own man self-managed virtual private cloud and they, they will um, either uh, give it directly to their users or use another mechanism to deliver those uh, VMs or projects to their users. And on top of it, you have projects that are the typical uh, OpenStack project concept that uh, you know about. So when we double click those, what is, does it mean? So we have large scale networks that are shared across all those uh, projects. And we abstract the network and we partition it using virtual networks. We have uh, multi-tier storage, or we'll soon have multi-tier st storage, um, as soon as uh, we deploy the Cinder component that supports multi-tier uh, storage. And uh, they can be used either by block or object storage. Then we have commodity hardware, because we need to have also a cost-effective cloud. So we have the same constraints than a public cloud. We have to not make um, revenue, but uh, at least be cost-efficient. And on top of it, we have different flavors. It could be flavors for front-end type of workloads or all the way to HPC type of uh, workloads where we have our analytics team or Hadoop team uh, running um, some uh, analytics uh, workloads. Um, and uh, we support Windows or Linux uh, images. And we, we have two styles of um, images. We have images that are community provided and uh, we don't uh, control what people put in, in those images. And we have images that we customize in order to um, implement some uh, best practices or integration with our infrastructure. So on top of the, 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 those concepts, we have the VPC concept. And each one of those objects will be mapped to a VPC. And we introduce the notion of class of service, which is kind of a set of policies that you can apply on top of a VPC in order to give it like a different behavior. So a VPC, you don't really know what are the security policies. It's up to you to define them. But since we provide shared VPCs, for example, for developers, we know what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. So on top of those VPC, we define like a configuration uh, templates, if you want, of policies that then customize access control, uh, cost, or even like location in the data center. And um, we, we add in the um, OpenStack API or OpenStack component, we had to add multiple um, metadata, if you want, to the various resources that OpenStack offers in order to map those resources to uh, the notion of VPC. So for example, a project for us can be assigned to a VPC. You, so you create a VPC and then inside you might have different uh, projects and each VPC has a different set of projects you can assign a network to a VPC. So a network would be private to a VPC. So if you have a developer specific VPC or a PayPal VPC or a GSI VPC, which are entities in eBay, uh, they will 
on that network and no one else will be able to get on that network if they decide that's their policy. And in the dashboard, we had to uh, customize it in order to allow users to select VPC or availability zone and um, do some uh, modification of the scheduler in Nova in order to allow the selection of networks either based on capacity or the previous tags that we put, put for VPC or class of service. And in images also, since we customize image for integration with um, a specific environment, um, we have to also specify if the image is specific to a VPC or if it's a, an image that would work in any VPC. So I can explain a bit what kind of uh, uh, VPC we have. So we have one VPC which is like uh, a public cloud. It behaves exactly like a public cloud. You push uh, your application in that VPC. You create a project, you push your application, and it's directly available on the internet. You, you, you can like, build uh, some experience and immediately um, expose it to users, but um, it's completely uh, in a DMZ. You cannot access any of the internal resource of eBay. It's really like if it was a public cloud available across the internet. But also we have a VPC that is like your desktop and um, an extension of your desktop. So you can run a workload, for example, for development or for testing of an application that you are currently developing. And um, you can see, for example, that in one, we can um, have uh, integration with our LDAP uh, for uh, allowing users to directly log in their VM. So our image have an integration with LDAP, uh, corporate LDAP, so that they can directly log with their login credentials. But if it's the public version, like the, the public VPC, they are completely shielded out of the, the corporate network, so they cannot uh, use their... Um, corporate LDAP credentials. They have to upload a key and use SSH keys in order to log, log into their uh, VPC. So that's the type of difference that we had to build in our image and then we have to tag those images with specific uh, capabilities and specific compatibility with VPCs. So that's at the high level what we, we had to do. And um, I'm going to give the mic to Subu and he's going to tell you why OpenStack is not a cloud. So thanks, JC. Uh, I, I took over the cloud uh, development as a chief engineer about last year. And uh, one of the first things I learned in the last first few months of my experience starting a cloud was that OpenStack is not cloud. So a couple of months back, I wrote a blog post that making a point that it was not cloud. And most folks that have built private clouds, large clouds, get it immediately. Yeah, yeah we know that. But if you ask a lot of uh, folks who have built smaller clouds, less than 50 machines, hypervisors, uh, it, that's not very clear. A lot of people see that OpenStack is a cloud in a box. You get, you know, you deploy like DevStack, boom, it's there. It's there. So uh, the key difference is that what our customers see, because at eBay, just like uh, JC said, we think and act like a public cloud. That is, all the APIs that OpenStack has are open to anyone, whether it's creating VMs, taking snapshots, bring your own images, write your own cloud unit scripts, whatever. And uh, what they want is an API abstraction that lets them do what they want to do without permissions and controls. In two minutes, they want a VM, most common use case. What they also want is cloud as a service. Uh, they don't want a software. Our tenants don't like to deploy and maintain soft, uh, OpenStack deployment. What they want is a service like AWS, like Rackspace Public Cloud. So from here to get there involves a lot of things. That is totally outside the purview of OpenStack as a core. For example, even before to get an OpenStack up and running, we spent time on network design, uh, InfoSec net, uh, deal with firewalls, uh, getting the builds up and running, do a CIFR changes, onboard the infrastructure, like JC was talking about, capacity addition. How can we add capacity quickly? Can I add a half a rack in 30 minutes? So that's the time we have to spend automating and building the tools. Uh, config management, we spend a lot of time automating our uh, puppet infrastructure to, make, to push changes uh, to production. That's not what customers see. What customers see is the blue box, blue, blue uh, circle. They want APIs. But this what happens behind the scenes. Same thing, high availability. 
And in order to get a good time to recovery, we have to also invest a lot of time in log processing, metrics collection, uh, monitoring of the cloud, not the VMs, but the cloud infrastructure, alerting, uh, incident resolution, like things go wrong, how do you communicate users, how do you deal with uh, their availability. And then, of course, user experience that it is seamless. So we uh, decided to expose, in fact, a, a lightly customized version of Horizon so that they are in charge of all interactions. Uh, customer support, uh, spending time with developers to explain how to use it, how to get around, or how best practices. SLAs, define an SLA so that they can trust us. So the journey, what we noticed in the last uh, year was that for the first six months, it was awesome. You get a VM in two minutes, or a block storage of a, a terabyte or whatever size, and that was agility. Now what people want is availability of the cloud. So we have to set SLAs. Not just that, we have to build mechanisms to measure an SLA. How do we know that we are up five nines or four nines? The, in addition to that, upgrades. So for example, we were last year, we were an SX. SX to fall some was a nightmare. We had to literally forklift each VM from an SX cloud to fall some. That's a lot of work for us. Capacity planning. How do we know that we are running capa low on capacity? How do we onboard capacity? Uh, scale out. Remediation, like hypervisor is alerting that there's an issue with their memory or disk. How do we deal with that? Auto scaling, metering and chargeback, monitoring, alerting. Those are again features that customers want. But ultimately what we want is a cloud as a service, not as a, as a software. So that journey is, is, is quite uh, fun, but also you may not know that you have to go through all that when you start out. At 50 hypervisors, you won't see it. When you have more than 50, go to 100, 150, you start to see the pain or investments that you have to make to run a service, as a cloud as a service, not a software. So uh, we thought we could talk forever on each of these bubbles, and there's a lot of work. So we picked up some topics uh, that, are, uh, that we experienced in the recent months and want to share ex our experience and learn from uh, this conference. One is we look at log processing metrics, how we do uh, collect metrics, how do we do alerting, uh, what's the pattern for scale out, so that we provide availability for the business as well as uh, a scalable infrastructure of the cloud, and uh, how do we deal with uh, things like builds and config management. So uh, let me start with the monitoring. Uh, we approached this problem in uh, two, two angles. When I started uh, this effort, I was working alone, first developer on the team. And uh, usually, something like this happens. A user starts, hey, I want to boot an instance of, a, of, a, of an image. Nova boot, minus, minus image, image ID, flavor, my VM. Happy path, two minutes later, you got a VM that you ha has an IP, you can SSH to it, things are good. When things go wrong, user says, is the cloud broken? And uh, like, I get anxious. I just log into each, each hypervisor or scheduler logs and all that to figure out, oh, no, no, it's not broken. You did something wrong. But that's fine when you have five developers using your cloud. But when you have 50 or 5,000, things change. Two things, you have to find out from that question to this answer, you want to get very fast, because that controls your time to recovery. So let me actually dive into that specific uh, 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 the use case. That's one, just one use case, most common use case. So when you create a VM, as you know, let's say you go through Horizon, request goes to Nova API. Then the scheduler got the request through RPC. Let me see if I can get the mouse pointer. Yeah, it, it's, it's okay. It's coming. Okay. Scheduler gets a request. Scheduler finds out the host. It does network selection because we do uh, network selection based on the class of service. Uh, the request goes to the Nova Compute. Uh, you get support, which in, in our case, it talks to the NVP controller. We use NVP uh, for the virtualization of the network layer. And the next step is Nova Compute gets the glance image from, the, from glance gives it off to KVM, boots the VM, goes to the cloud in it, everything else happens. Now, there are many points of failure in this. 
For example, rabbit and might choke. Just 10 days back, we had a, an outage that starts at 8, 8 in the evening, and we don't know why provisioning is failing. So after a while, we figure out, oh, it's rabbit MQ. One of the nodes is, is, is dropping messages. We have to do something about it. Capacity issues. Oftentimes, scheduler dumps a warning in, the, in a database table called instance false, and uh, because there's no capacity, hypervisors ran out, or network ports ran out, or quantum plugin failed. Glance is down, or it timed out for some reason. In fact, we had one uh, case where we, without thinking much, we deployed a, f a load balancer behind, in front of Glance APIs. And it was choking. It was throttling our, our traffic for Glance images. So it was failing, and provision was, was failing. Now, the thing is that at that point, when it hands off, Nova hands off to libvirt, it says VM state is active. You look at the dashboard or Nova show. It says green, awesome. But user says, I can't log in. Because some things happen after that. Like, for example, uh, it might not have gotten DHCP. Because again, there was a, a delay between, let's say, quantum and uh, DHCP agent. Or there was a failure, some, some other failure there. Or the metadata timed out. Because Cloud Init goes through metadata API to, to download, uh, let's say, the SSH keys. So you may actually get a brick from Nova. So in the early stages last year, we were actually logging, literally logging into each machine to figure out what was going on. And we had to change that. So the way we approached is that uh, very straightforward. Each component in OpenStack does a good job of logging, except that they all log in different ways. There are inconsistencies in the way things are logged. And we use what is called as log stash. Uh, which is a, an extremely well-written, uh, flexible uh, 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 logging, log, log processing framework. We use that framework and tra trans to transport log messages into Elasticsearch, where we then use Kibana. Kibana is a dashboard uh, built for log stash on Elasticsearch. We use that to uh, basically search for logs. Now. Uh, Three things we have to do here. Two things we have to do here. First is the grok patterns. So log stash is just what is called a grok pattern uh, that you can inject. Let's say I want to process Nova API logs. And you know the structure of what, what the API log looks like. And then based on that, you write a pattern to extract different fields like log levels, timestamps, uh, messages, and whatnot. And uh, they end up in the Elasticsearch cluster. The beauty of that is that it's horizontally scalable. Right now, we process a few terabytes of log messages every month. And usually, it takes about uh, less than five seconds for a log message to appear, uh, appear in Kibana from the time it was logged. So if I say Nova show, in five seconds, I have the trace of that, log, that, message, that request in Kibana. So the outcome was that if I know the request ID, of the, the command, let's say Nova boot, I can trace where it went through, whether from Nova API to scheduler to hypervisors. Awesome. We spent another sprint a few months back to actually process more data out of logs. So we started collecting uh, response codes, latencies from all the APIs. Now we can see. Uh, for, I think the picture is too small here, but uh, these are response codes and latencies for one of the APIs. Now, from week over week, I know if the latency is increased or response uh, error codes increased, I can track that. More of that. Now, we are able to get all this data. This is great. But often, that's not actually what I want. What I want is metrics. Because logs are great. When I know something is wrong, I can go back and debug. But I want uh, to see metrics as an operator of cloud. I want uh, to see mon do, do monitoring so that I can set thresholds and get alerted when things go wrong. And of course, there's a pager, if you remember. <laughs> uh, it does its job. I mean, you know, we can react to errors. So what we did was that we took what we built for, logs, uh, for log aggregation and introduced Stats3, which is a a small node program 
uh, open source by HC a couple of years ago. What it does is it actually starts counting things. It starts counting things like you know, error codes in the last uh, 60 seconds. Is it, uh, if you see a higher rate of uh, errors, we can count that. We send that to Graphite, Graphite for, as a time series store, and uh, Zabbix, we used Zabbix for, for alerting. We started with Nagios. We were not happy with the experience, mainly because we didn't find it as programmable as Zabbix was. So we switched to Zabbix, and then expanded that to all the infrastructure, for all open stack nodes, as well as MVP infrastructure. We start uh, even the block storage. We aggregate that into Zabbix. So we have lots of lots of data. Uh, in fact, we have too much data now. We have too many graphs and too many alerts that can, that can actually flood us. Again, we still have an issue. If the user says, is the cloud broken? We got better, but still the answer was a maybe. We were always not sure if the cloud is working the way it's supposed to work. So then we had to go back and, and do some more, uh, some more work. So uh, we looked at other sources of information. So if you look at database, uh, let's say a scheduler failed, and database has there's a table called uh, instance faults in Nova that has a deep, uh, a complete exception stack trace. That's useful. So if you look at it, if you can count those exceptions, if there's a higher rate, you know there's a problem. So we wrote something called uh, a stack matrix, which is a pretty dumb Python program, which periodically wakes up reads all the database tables, counts things like how many users are there, how many projects are there, what's the VM count, how many VMs are in uh, non-active non state, or uh, for example, in Nova there are instance uh, task states, like creating, scheduling, deleting. And you can actually see if a, an instance is in a task state longer than maybe a minute, there is an issue, it's stuck. So we start counting all those things and publish to Graphite and Zabbix. There's one more thing. Uh, we actually get some false positives out of uh, this model. Because sometimes, let's say there's no alert. Maybe because nobody's using the cloud at the time. It's a weekend, it's down, nobody's using it. But maybe there was a problem. Or, or false positives because the user has, has a mistake. Let's say somebody started a new image that has a bug in it, and all projects is failing. And to avoid those false positives, we wrote something called a stack watch, which is a small uh, bot that looks at all the KPIs that we want to track as a cloud operator, like provisioning VMs or creating volumes, ping success rates, ping latencies. We take that and uh, simulate those user actions. Those are controlled actions, so we can measure the outcome. We do that and then again publish data to Graphite and Zabbix. With that, we are able to say, if there's an incident that cloud is not responding, the provisioning is failing, we pretty much know before users know it. We get the logs, we get the alerts, but in addition to that, we use the same data to actually present that information to end users, so they can actually answer that question on their own. So, and again, it's, a, it's like a wall of, fa wall of uh, fame or shame, depending on if, if your numbers are good on that status board on the right side, it's wall of fame. If they're bad, it's wall of shame for us to improve that. So this, this journey took about uh, many, like two, three iterations over a year, period of a year. And we got into much better state as we scaled. We are able to react to incidents much faster. So that is the uh, work what we did for logging. The next topic I would like to uh, talk about is uh, scale out. So uh, we, like, as JC was pointing out, we took the public cloud as a, as a principle in our minds, even though we are operating a private cloud. And uh, there's, always two, there's always a tension. For example, as we start adding hypervisors, uh, infrastructure grows. When infrastructure grows, things start to behave differently, like RabbitMQs or network gateways. Uh, things like that happen. 
so we have to find a way to split the cloud into multiple clouds. But if you have more than one cloud, you don't have a cloud, you have a problem. Because users start to see multiple clouds, and that's not a good, good user experience. So there is this tension between uh, 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 also availability, because if you have one single cloud, all eggs are in the same basket. If you have multiple clouds, users get to split the, uh, split the application across different availability zones. And so what we uh, looked at OpenStack patterns, like availability zones, uh, if anyone recalls, in SX there's something called availability zone, uh, which is an unfortunate choice of name at that time. It probably made sense for a, a simple VM cloud. It no longer makes sense, because it does not let you uh, create availability zones like you can do, for example, on AWS. Keystone has this notion called regions, which is a, a way to group API endpoints into uh, groups. And NOAA has this notion of cells that from Grizzly onwards. So we try to do a mapping exercise between uh, what OpenStack provides and what, what we need from the, from the cloud. And looked at AWS. The model is very straightforward. People understand that, which actually makes a good balance between availability of the application and the scale out. Because as a user, you see maybe 20 odd availability zones in a single cloud. You still get that single cloud experience, uh, but are able to spread your application across availability zones. So in OpenStack, it became a bit uh, tricky uh, initially. And uh, after some analysis, we actually found out what's the right pattern for a business. So on the right, uh, you see all the data plane components, hypervisor, block storage, <coughs> excuse me, network drivers and storage. And uh, on the right side, you see the, on the left side, you see the control plane for that. The, there are two things that we had to consider. One is that in OpenStack, unfortunately, the line between the control plane and data plane is not always clear, depending on your architecture. For example, if I take my Neutron or Quantum API down, is the cloud working? If you're using DHCP, probably not. Leases time out, and uh, leases don't get renewed, and your cloud is down. So that line is not very clear. Same thing for Swift. Of course, Swift is understood. It's, a, it's in the data path. It has to be available. So there are these dependencies. But also, uh, the other thing we considered was that if I am creating infrastructure in an availability zone, I need to know which availability zone I'm creating that infrastructure in. So there's a strong coupling between uh, the API endpoints and the data, the, the data plane infrastructure behind those APIs. So we sort of do a boundary to define what an availability zone for us means. This is not Nova availability zone. This is our model of availability zones. Again, very similar to what Amazon does on AWS. So we draw a line around the APIs on the data plane. Very simple model, easy to explain users. And uh, we map that to the constructs that exist in OpenStack. So that's how our model looks like. So we have three regions. Again, that region here is not what you see in Keystone. Our definition of region is an independent deployment in a data center area, which may have multiple buildings, multiple, multiple uh, spread apart, maybe a few millisecond latency. And the, the choice we make is that each region is fully independent. If there is a failure in that, in that region, it's totally isolated from other regions. Uh, then further, we break down each region into multiple availability zones. That includes all the availability zone services and the data path for that uh, behind those uh, APIs. Again, that's mapped to, in Keystone, like a region. So we have to do sort of mental ma mapping between what exists in OpenStack and what we need uh, to arrive at what uh, a, a multi-region experience for our customers, making it trade-off between uh, availability and uh, uh, user experience. So uh, the final topic is uh, build and deployment. So. This is basically a journey of what went through, what happened when we started the cloud. 
initially we start with Ubuntu SX, uh, do the APT install using Fabric, we sort of set up the cloud. 50 hypervisors, awesome, it was painless. But oh, as we grew in terms of scale as well as the team size, uh, that started falling apart. We then invested in Puppet infrastructure and Foreman, and we are able to create pet test clouds. That means each we have a few test clouds where we can roll out changes and test them. But what we found was that uh, relying on a public repository like APT was not uh, good enough for us because things break and we have to make fixes to it. Sometimes we do, we have to uh, pull, pull down changes from the next version of OpenStack, like we had to pull changes from Grizzly to Folsom. Same thing we did last week uh, to Quantum, we had to pull down some changes from Trunk. So that model started breaking down. And the last design summit in uh, Portland, we talked to Rackspace folks and we actually found out what they were doing, sort of learning from their experience, and uh, expanded what we were doing. So we invested in three things. A bare metal provisioning AP layer uh, for the entire topology, from hypervisors to controllers to NDP infrastructure. Then we ditched uh, APT packages and went to virtual environments, Python virtual environments, to create completely uh, self-contained tarballs and use that as a deployment unit still using Foreman and Puppet. So today we are able to bring up a test cloud in a few hours, end to end, complete working cloud, so we can test things in that cloud. So from pet clouds, we went to cattle clouds. And that also enabled us to do patches and partial upgrades. So we don't have complete, uh, we don't always stick to the same release of OpenStack. We sometimes mix and match based on features that exist in certain components. Uh, we still have some problems in what we are doing. One is Puppet, as we know, is change orchestration is hard. As, uh, with scale, oftentimes we want to roll out changes to a subset of hypervisors, or a subset of controller nodes, or one uh, a part of the infrastructure. And with Puppet, it was, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not working out very well, so we are looking at other alternatives, in addition to Puppet, to work with salt stack or something else to orchestrate the change. Again, Foreman UI, uh, it worked out well in a, when we were a small team. But doing click ops, what I mean is that you go to the UI to make state changes, config changes, that doesn't seem right anymore. So we are looking at, again, alternatives on how to solve that. So uh, in this process, uh, what we ended up building was a full uh, orchestration, a topology orchestration that works out of the box. So we are working on open sourcing uh, uh, that complete automation. With, that includes the log, logging, uh, aggregation, log aggregation, Elasticsearch, Zabbix alerts, and all the tools that go with it. And we are working on uh, getting it out. Zabbix templates, uh, we worked with our colleagues at PayPal uh, to actually build a rich set of Zabbix, Zabbix templates to monitor everything from uh, hypervisors to NVP infrastructure to solidify that we use for, as a backend device. Uh, the tools that we wrote and the, the, the lot of work that went into creating VPCs, uh, we are, JC and I are, are thinking about how to make it part of the community so that uh, we don't have to work around the core. Today we are working around the core. For example, we had to map, uh, we had to redo scheduling to get what we want, network selection or uh, managing projects or, or managing projects in each domain, in each uh, VPC. So there's some uh, gaps that we found out, and uh, we want to contribute on scale-out patterns, that uh, what we learned from the last year. And that brings to my last slide. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, actually, uh, let, the question was, uh, this looks like a complicated uh, change to OpenStack. What I want to say is that we didn't have to uh, tweak or fork OpenStack to make this work. Uh, thanks to the community, the extensibility models that exist in Keystone, 
Nova, Glance, Visgi, things like that made it possible for us. So we, do, we, we still are, our code is the same as what we see in github.com. It's no different, except that we introduce code to extension points, like, like scheduler, host selection, network selection, or keystone uh, the project mapping, things like that. It was not uh, hard at all. I think the conceptual, it took a while for us to find the mappings. So the question was, there are too many components uh, in this. Isn't that complicated, complicating your uh, topology? Yeah. I, I think there's no choice. Because when you're running a software, uh, when you're running a service, you have to have the support mechanism, support tools to run it efficiently. Because our commitment to business is availability for the business and efficiency. And we can't get there just with native OpenStack. And there's, there's no out-of-the-box solution anyway, so we found, that we found that we have to build it ourselves. I think we have to leave the room now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>